Good morning. Thank you for being here. At this time, if we could go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you this morning for everything you've given us. We thank you for the time and to do this Bible study together. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would speak through your word, that you would be with us, Lord, and edify your church. We thank you so much for everything that you are doing. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, if you would open your Bible up to Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at a portion of Scripture uh, that is the Beatitudes, uh, the most blessed sayings of Christ. Uh, and opening up, while you're turning your Bible there, one of the things that this addresses is the blessed life. Now, we misinterpret the word blessed many times. We think of it as happiness, which it can be to a sense, uh, but, but this is a pursuit and something that sticks in our mind, the term happy. Uh, and it's more than that. I want us to see that this morning. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, as you know, it says uh, we, are, we are entitled to the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this is ingrained in who we are as a people. Everyone wants happiness. We look for happiness in relationships. We look for happiness in career. We look for happiness in material possessions. But when the relationship hits hard times, and when the career is over, and and when the material possessions begin to fade, well, then that happiness goes away, and we look for something else. It was the great theologian John Calvin who said this, While all men seek after happiness, scarcely one in a hundred looks for it from God. Prophet Jeremiah put it in a different way. He said this in Jeremiah 2.13, or rather God speaking through the prophet says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fount of living water, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, I want you to think of this image that the prophet paints, or rather God says through Jeremiah. It's this broken basket and this man dying of thirst in the desert. And instead of picking a basket of water that is solid, that can hold living water, he picks a basket that, that can hold no water. It's got a gaping hole in the middle of it. Now, we would say that's insane, right? But I want you to think about this. It's just as insane to think we can find fulfillment, happiness, apart from God, our Creator. One of my favorite books of the Bible is Ecclesiastes. And the reason I love Ecclesiastes is because it's like a mirror to the human soul. King Solomon wrote this book, in, and I call it an experiment on life, as we know, Solomon, the richest man to ever live, the wisest man to ever live. And he conducts this experiment on life with his resources, with his wealth, with his knowledge and wisdom to see if he can find happiness under the sun, that is, apart from God. And Solomon looks for happiness in his relationships. He had 700 wives, and when he saw that the Institute of Marriage wasn't quite doing it for him, Solomon got 300 concubines on top of that. And at the end of that matter, Solomon said, this is vanity. Solomon looked for meaning and, and happiness in uh, his wealth, his accomplishments. And the same thing, Solomon over and over in this experiment found that life was meaningless without God. At the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes this, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. So the richest, the wisest man to ever live says, through the writings of Ecclesiastes, I've lived a life that you cannot live, and I have wealth that you will never, ever acquire. And the means to conduct this experiment on happiness, on life, and I have found it vain apart from God. And the sad thing is that we keep repeating the experiment of Solomon over and over, thinking we will have different results. This morning, again, turn your Bible to Luke chapter 6. We're going to pick up in verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him. For power came out of him and healed them all. Now, very quickly, the text says that Jesus was at a level place. This is a probably a plateau on a side of a mountain. Many commentators have said that. Uh, this was the Beatitudes, uh, the sermon Jesus preached. 
in the book of Matthew, uh, some have said that maybe this was a different instance, that, that Jesus was merely preaching the same sermon. But regardless, it is the same timeless truths that Jesus is preaching. And he begins to talk about the blessed life. And I want us to see that this morning that mirrors the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, before we get there, the Apostle Paul says this, Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself, or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. As we look at the blessed life in the book of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, I want you to consider this is more than than a rule book to happiness. This is a litmus test, I believe, to true faith, to true Christianity. And the Apostle Paul says, look, don't look to your baptism. Don't look to your church membership. Look and examine yourself by the words of Christ, by Scripture, to know that you were saved. Number one, Jesus blessed, says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor. In Luke 6.20, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples, and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Now, the poor here is not speaking of material wealth or, or material poverty. It's rather speaking of poverty in a spiritual sense, that is, to be poor in spirit. How do I know that? Well, Matthew 5.3 tells us this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So poverty of spirit is this. It is being spiritually bankrupt, or rather seeing your spiritual bankruptcy and knowing that you have nothing without Christ. You can't earn your own righteousness. You can't earn your way to heaven. You need the grace of God, and you see yourself as a depraved sinner who is in need of grace. And everything without Jesus, all the worldly accolades that we could get, all the riches that we could attain are but mere garbage without him. In fact, that's what the Apostle Paul had said in Philippians 3.8. Paul wrote, Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul had a poverty of spirit. Charles Wesley wrote of this poverty of spirit uh, in the hymn that he wrote, Jesus, lover of my soul. And part of that hymn goes like this. Just and holy is your name. I am all unrighteousness. Vile and full of sin I am. You are full of grace and truth. Poverty of spirit is the opposite of pride. It's rooted in humility. So the Christian doesn't proclaim himself. Rather, the Christian proclaims Christ in all things. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul writes, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Poverty of spirit is seeing ourselves as who we are, depraved, wretched sinners apart from the grace of God. Number two, Jesus says, blessed are the hungry and the mourners. Blessed are the hungry and the mourners. Luke chapter 6, verse 21. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, you shall laugh. Now, in the same context as poverty of spirit, this is not talking about a physical hunger per se, a physical mourning. Rather, this is spiritual here. The notion of hungering and mourning is a hunger for righteousness and a mourning over our sins, hungering for God's way and not our own. The poverty of spirit leads to a hunger for righteousness. I, I want you to see the interconnectedness of this. A poverty of spirit in someone leads to the hunger for righteousness and the mourning over their sins. The believer cannot pat themselves on the back and, and, and just walk through life sinning and saying, well, God must deal with it because he made me this way. I'm sure you've heard that before. Rather, the Christian has a new nature where they actually hate their sins, and they don't want to walk in that way. Rather, they want to walk in the righteousness of Christ, and they desire that, and they hunger for that. Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
for they shall be satisfied. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus satisfies our spiritual hunger for him and wipes away the tears of mourning over sin. God gives us that promise. So many people have asked, Pastor, how do I know that I know that I know that I'm saved? Well, I believe we can ask questions like Paul posed. I believe we can examine ourselves internally and ask these things. Are, am I growing day by day to be more hungry for God's word? Am I mourning over my sin? Does it break my heart when I sin? Or rather, do I continue to entertain these things because I love my sin more than God? You see, I think these are litmus tests of the faith that we can look inward and see. Do I desire to be like Christ? This is not talking of, of sinless perfection because we all fall short of the glory of God, but it is saying that when we sin, do we weep over it? And do we desire to turn from that sin and run after Christ? King David and his attitude in the Psalms gives me much hope, and, and I love to see how David mourned over his sin and desired Christ, desired God. Psalm 42, 1 and 2, David paints this picture for us. He writes, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And I would ask, does this describe you? Does this describe me? When we see our sins, are we like David, where we would say, as a, a starving, dehydrated animal, is gasping for water, desiring, thirsting for water. So David says, this is how my soul feels without God. And I would ask, is this true of us? Or is it just Sunday morning or Wednesday night? Do we just routinely walk in the doors and expect to hear a certain message and walk out unchanged? Or do we weep? Do we mourn? Do we hunger? Do we desire him? These are marks of a blessed person, and the blessed are the ones that will inherit the kingdom of God. Number three, blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are the persecuted. Luke 6.22, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and when they revile you and spurn your name as evil on the count of the Son of Man. This is something that we wouldn't consider to be blessed. You know, the word blessed is butchered today many times in our world. We say we're blessed when we have wealth. We say we're blessed on a sunny day. We, we say we're blessed with health. We're, we're, we're blessed when good things happen to us. But you don't hear someone say they're blessed when persecution comes, when people slander their name for Christ. Matthew 5.10, this is the, the mirror image of what we just read in Luke. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and other all, all kinds of evil against your name falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When we stand for Christ, the world will hate us. That does not mean that we go out looking to be hated by the world, but when you stand firm on truth and proclaim that truth in a world that does not believe that truth, you will have opposition. One Puritan wrote this, everyone who has spoken well of me today, Lord, where have I gone astray? And it's kind of comical, but at the same time, we can see the heart of this man in a world that, that hates the gospel. If we're not proclaiming the gospel, that's a contrary message to the world, then we're not going to receive any opposition. But opposition will come when we stand on truth. Some of the truths that the world hates, God created only two sexes, male and female. Marriage is between a man, biologically a man, and a woman. Uh, there's only one way to be saved. That is through the precious blood of Christ and repentance and faith that, it, that is given through him. These are truths that are not grasped by the world, by the culture at large. John 15, 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before you. 
Matthew 10, 22, you will be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. Again, the Christian doesn't go looking for conflict, but in the same manner, the Christian doesn't go looking for friendship with the world. We don't try to appease the world, to be like the world, in order to gain the world's favor. Because again, if you try to appease the world, to dress up the church like the world in order to win the world, the gospel will never be enough. You will have to continue entertaining them. You will have to continue with the the smoke and lights. You will have to continue with the show to get their attention, and the gospel will not be enough. And I'm here to say that the gospel is powerful to save, and it is fully sufficient. It needs no help. It just needs to be proclaimed rightly. A call to rejoice. Look at Luke 6.23. Jesus says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Now we should ask when we read any scripture questions. So what are we to rejoice in in that day? Well, look back at what we have just read in the gospel of Luke. Rejoice in the day when you weep over your sin. Rejoice in the day when you begin to hunger for righteousness. Rejoice in that day when you are persecuted, slandered for the name of Christ because of standing upon his truth. Why should we rejoice in these things? Because, Jesus says, your reward is great in heaven. When we're broken over our sins, when we're desiring him over the world, when popularity of the world doesn't matter, that's when we know that we've been changed. Christ also gives characteristics of the lost. Luke 6, 24. But woe to you who are rich, you've received your consolation. Again, this is not talking about a, a material richness, wealth per se, because it is not a sin to have money. It's a sin for money to have you, that is to be an idol. Rather, this is talking about a spiritual woe, a spiritual richness. Uh, It's the opposite of poverty of spirit. It is rich in spirit. An example of rich in spirit would be in Luke 18, 11. Let me read it for us. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified. That's a big, big telling sign there. That spiritual pride, it's richness that we see in the Pharisee saying, aren't you glad that I have done these things, God? I am so righteous in my own name. I have earned my salvation because I'm not like these other sinners. But you see, the man that is spiritually impoverished would say this, I'm no better than anyone else. And I can't justly point out someone else's sin without first pointing back at my own. I'm broken. I'm a sinner. Lord, give me your grace. That's spiritual poverty. And Jesus gives these woes, again, 625 of Luke. Woe to you who are now full, you shall be hungry. Again, this is the opposite of being spiritually or hungry for Christ, hungry for righteousness. This is the one that is not hungry for Christ. He's full of himself or herself. He doesn't have a hunger for righteousness or weeping over sin. Luke 625. Woe to you who are now full, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh, for you shall now mourn. Again, this is the opposite of someone who would mourn over their sins. Jesus says, woe to you who would laugh over your sin. You see, these attributes of Christ we see shining through. And not only is this passage about the blessed life, but it is also about the one called blessed who receives the kingdom of heaven. Again, these would be marks of true saving faith. I pray that we would all take these to heart and these would be precious to us as the days ahead come near. We thank you for everything you've given us, God. And at this time, I pray that you were blessed by this message and that the word of God spoke loudly. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it chisels us, how it makes us new. 
how it gives us confidence of our salvation, Lord, and how you have called us, as the Apostle Paul wrote, to examine ourselves through Scripture. We thank you for these marks of the blessed, of true saving faith, and we pray, Lord, that you would continue to conform us more and more into your image, that we would be those royal priesthood that you would call us to be, being lights in the dark world. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.